Hey, this is Veronica Taylor, and from myself and Ash Ketchum, you're listening to Southern Fried Geekery. I guess that's what that. Yeah, she's she got. Yeah, she's brushing it. This cat is. <laughs> this is so funny. I need I, you uh, to explain. Like, like I need you. To, I need color commentary on what brushing a cat looks like. Well, now she's doing the ass. Um, oh. Yeah, she's got you know like you brush a dog to brush the you know the the shedded hair out or whatever. Yeah. She's doing this to the cat. This cat's rolling around on the pavement. She's brushing his belly. Then he'll get up so she can do his back. I mean, this is so funny. Cat and the cat's not awesome. mauling this person? Hell no, dude. He's eating it up. He's having the time of his life. I'm calling witchcraft. He's bro- this is so funny. Yeah, that's really funny. The cat did not want her to stop. He was loving that. I was like, man, that looks really... I mean, I should go over there and ask for some of that. that I guess good. I haven't been around enough cats. I never... like. I just assume that they will murder you if you get within three feet of them. I don't, you know, that's the, I think that's the best way to handle cats. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, we can talk this way because Craig's not on the show. That's true. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but again, if you, if you have your cat in the driveway and they're letting you brush them, I'm assuming there's witchcraft involved. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I just think that's the best way to look at it. Well, like you said, um, Craig is not going to be on the show this week. It is, it is Father's Day and he is doing Father's Day ish type things along with, um, moving one of his beloved children um, because that's, you know, a great combination of what you want to do on Father's Day. That did uh, not occur to me. Oh, my God. Yeah, so our buddy's not going to be with us today. So, Matt, you think we can handle it? No. No. (laughs) (laughs) But we're going to do it anyway. Let's do it. Um, Hey, this is Caleb Alexander McKenzie, as usual, and you're listening to the Southern Fried Geekery podcast. And I've got my buddy Matt. We're not even going to – Matt, go ahead and tell him your name because only you can do that. Yep, Matt Trogdon, the same. Hey, buddy. Um, you know what episode this is, man? 129 or 130. Damn it. 130. Yeah. We, we are I, I, out of the 120s. We are now graduated to another step. Oh, no. Graduation with comes responsibility. No, not on this show. This, this oh, show, good. The, the more we do it, the less we feel like we have to do. <laughs> so, oh. So. oh, man, that's a relief. <laughs> um. But welcome, everybody who's listening to the show. We're glad you stuck around with us for 130 episodes. Uh, it's been a wild ride, and my dog is shaking. That was what that weird thunderous noise was. Um, it's, it's been fun. Uh, this is the Southern Fried Geekery Podcast. We are a comics and pop culture podcast. For those of you who may be new, uh, welcome. If you want to come see what we're doing, come talk to us, come hang out with us, you can find us on the Facebooks. We have a little group going. You can also check out panels of what we're reading and I just see general opinions and tags and stuff on Twitter. We're at SFG Podcast on uh, Instagram and Twitter because we're not creative. We didn't feel like making up new handles. Uh, we're lazy, really, is what it amounts to. Um, but if you have any questions or comments, you can always throw us a line at our email address, which is Southern Fried Geekery at gmail.com. Um, cause we're connective like that. How's your week going, man? It's going well, probably better than I deserve. Oh, don't say that. I think that's the best way to look at every day. <laughs> it's a, that's a positive statement. That's not a negative statement. Better than I deserve. That's, that means you feel lucky to have what you have. That's true. But I generally think you deserve all the good things. You know, I feel so as I feel so as well, but I generally don't get those as many. I wake up every morning and I look at, in the mirror as I brush my teeth and I say, I want Matt to have the best things, specifically you. Just I want you to have the best things. Yeah. Every morning. I appreciate I appreciate every that. Single morning. First thought when I wake up is of Matt Drogdon. Yeah, that's flattering, I have to say, but I'm I have to also say it's probably not good for you. <laughs> <laughs> as as the good things don't come my way. Mm. Um, well, it's been a busy week. Uh, I know lots going on. Lots going on in the world. Lots going on in life. Um, new jobs for the both of us. We're working. We're doing the things. Uh, but fitting in some time to read comics in there has been trying. I don't know. Are you having a? Did you have a tough time finding space to read this week? Um, I did, but nothing too out of the ordinary. Yeah, but yeah, I had to I had to work it in. I guess I should say 
that's kind of what it felt like. And, and I don't know, I've been in a weird, funky mood the past few weeks where it feels like I'm having to shoehorn, or usually like comics are what I go to, like I'm excited about it. I find myself like having to shoehorn reading time in. I don't know. It's a, it's a weird it happens. Funky place. It happens. And it's not, that's not an indication on the quality of what I'm reading. Like it's not because there's right. not, nothing good to read. It's just my, like where my mindset is. It's just like, oh, let me, let me do this. Um, but once I get, once I do it, once I get started, then it's fun. It just, mm -hmm. it's, it's like making myself do something I know I'll enjoy, which is a weird, uh, it's a weird mentality. Uh, yep. But I did, I did get some reading done. So I, uh, you want to, you want to do short stacks, drop a little short stackage. Yep. Let's All do right. It. Um, I read this week a couple of new things and one not so new things. Uh, the first thing on the short stack I read is Wonder Woman number 757. Uh, this this has just been a fun arc, man. Are you? I'm not sure. Are you a Wonder Woman fan? Have you been reading this? Um, I'm a Wonder Woman fan, but I've not been reading this. Okay. Um, this is kind of the first, the wrap up of Steve Orlando's first arc on the book. And essentially it's dealing with a... Uh, so there's a a big bad guy, quote unquote, uh, that is she kind of has her own like female four horsemen of the apocalypse, if that makes sense. Uh, and the legacy of this character goes way back. You know, if you haven't if anybody who's listening hasn't read it, they, they should. But what was really fun about this ending of the arc and, you know, spoilers, I guess we should say spoilers for everything throughout the show. We're talking about comics. So, um, you know, here's your warning. If you hear us say something you haven't read it yet, then then duck out for a like, couple seconds. Don't get mad at us. But um, spoilers for Wonder Woman uh, 756 and 757, Donna Troy shows up and is, is working on that. And that's just, like, I love seeing Diana and Donna on the page together. And Steve Orlando writes them really well. Uh, did I, Matt, did I dream that uh, G. Willow Wilson was writing Wonder Woman? No, she was for a while. Um, she wrote, I want to say, 12 issues. Okay. Maybe less. Uh, I want to say she did a 12 issue arc. I could be wrong on that though. But um, Steve Orlando took it over. Uh, let's see. Let me see if I can find the title page to this because normally says which one it is. Nope, it just says finale. <laughs> so I want to say uh, he's been writing it for four or five issues, maybe six. Oh, okay. Um, but he's, he's, he started off um, a little bland. But I think that's, you know, whenever you're a new creator on a. Pro property like Wonder Woman or just these kind of long held things where you're trying to find your footing and your story and something that's been around for 80 years. It, it takes a minute to get your, uh, to, to gather your thoughts. Um, but the arc is ending really well. Uh, so check that out if you haven't. Um, do you remember way back in the day, um, what feels like 17 years ago, but was actually probably the first of the year we read a book called Tartarus. Yep. Um, I read the third issue of that, which came out. Um, I, I love this series. Uh, absolutely. There's, there's nothing about this series that, that doesn't do everything I want it to do. Um, and, and I know that was a question at first because the way the first issue started off, it, it led you one way and gave you a backstory and then it flipped the script on you and brought you into the future. And most of the story, um, as a whole has stayed with that. It's, it, it hasn't gone back to um, the the mother of the story who was in the first part. It's still focusing on the daughter who is in the what would be the present of the story, but it's still incredibly good. Johnny Christmas and Jack T. Cole are just killing it, um, kicking much ass as as I like to say on it. Fun, weird sci-fi story. Uh, it, inevitably, it's a story about family though, um, which is happy making. And then, um, and I've spoken on this a few times more so in the short stacks than anything else, but there is a series that is on comiXology that I've been reading, and it's actually a manga, and it's called Drops of God. I read the seventh volume of that uh, this week, and it's the seventh volume is really, it's kind of a side quest, if, if that's the way you want to think about uh, these long <laughs> arcing stories, so it kind of steps away from the main, um, the main theme of the the main character and uh, being juxtaposed with somebody else that he's fighting for his father's legacy, essentially. Um, so this kid, his dad is a, or was a wine um, trendsetter, aficionado, uh, kind of the world's most famous sommelier and dad died. You know, the kid was trying to walk his own path and stayed away from wine, but in order to, I guess, get his father's estate and to get what the will is leaving him, 
he has to find what's called the the drops of God and the twelve apostles. So it's basically a blind taste test that's been organized with uh, another character. Well, that's the main theme of the entirety of the story. Um, in this particular arc, a person from one of his friends' pasts comes up and is also trying to start their own wine business um, and makes a bet with them to do this like little smaller blind taste test uh, where they're juxtaposing these insanely expensive um, top-of-the-line uh, by price point wines and a cheaper but yet theoretically just as good of a quality wine. Um, and whoever wins... Uh, basically is going to determine who um, one of the the tangential characters works for. Um, so there's a there's a girl that's part of this little team, um, and she she's a practicing sommelier. She's trying to learn, but she's really good. Um, but whoever wins this bet essentially is going to get to keep her on uh, as far as like employee. Like she said, hey, if you win, I'll go work for your company. But if he wins, I stay with him, and you give us like credit or some shit. Um, it was really, it's, it's really fun. Kind of like I said, a side, a side quest to the story, but, um, light, lighthearted reading. Um, I love wine. So again, reading all about wine is interesting to me, um, from the aspect of people who know what they're talking about. Uh, so I, I enjoy it. Plus it, you know, on some level, it is a weird, dumb, fun adventure built on really random things. <laughs> so hmm. I enjoy it. Check it out if you haven't. Like I said, it's on Comicsology. They've got all of it. Um, it's called Drops of God. Hmm. Pretty intense. The uh, title doesn't belay the content because the title is pretty, pretty intense. Well, um, yeah. So the the point behind the Drops of God. So essentially, Dad, you know people who the pretentiousness of the wine world or the pretentiousness of just kind of any world. Um, the Dad has set up these. 12 wines, but he won't tell people what they are, but he just wants them to get the description as close to him. And these are what he calls the 12 apostles of wine. And then there is a 13th, which is the, uh, just the culmination of everything that dead daddy thought wine should be. Um, and he calls that the drops of God wine, like blood. Um, mm. so it's, it, it's cool. They, they use a lot of, uh, judeo-christian analogies for for wine but not in the sense they're not proselytizing by any means um but it just brings a yeah it it brings a drama to the whole thing. i'm shuffling my shoulders while i say it brings the drama mm. <laughs> well um also bringing the drama i read um, from dc's black label issue two of tom king's and mitch jared's strange adventures uh, so nice. the saga of Adam Strange continues on. Uh, this issue kind of drug a little bit. Um, really hoping the next one picks up. Um, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Certainly, uh, felt milked, I'll say. Well, um, not bad in quality, just felt milked. Capital if, M. If I remember right, that's been a like kind of an ongoing criticism of Tom King's work from you is, is pacing issues. Not consec, not consistently. Okay. Um, some, some of his stuff, you know, it just, man, it just, uh, some of his work, mm -hmm. it just seems like it comes across very clear that he's trying to stretch a story out. Um, and we're issue, we're in issue two of this one. And this one felt that way to me, but, I don't know. We'll see. I'm going to give this one, I'm going to give this one, a, you know, more of a chance to keep me on. Okay. But we'll see. It looks great. I mean, I, you know, it, it certainly looks great. Those doc so, pages are just mwah, chef's kiss. Also, I read issue number three from aftershock from John Lehman and Carl Mostert, the man who effed up time. <laughs> so this is just getting crazier. Uh, it's a, it's a, wacky time travel story. I usually steer clear of time travel stories of any way, shape or form. Um, but this one, John Layman's put his own little, his own little flavor to it, which is hilarious and weird. And it's just too funny to look away from. So 
you know, the, the story definitely took a turn in this issue. You really learn some new things to put a whole new, uh, you know, uh, field of vision on the story. So mm -hmm. I recommend that one if you're looking for something that's just funny and fun to read. Um, not funny, not fun to read as the third thing I'm going to mention. Uh, so this was a very light week for me for comics. I had four comics that I purchased in total that were new releases. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so to supplement that, the uh, proprietor of Kapow Comics offered to sell me some dollar issues, the uh, four issues of a four-part series from 1996. Uh, this was written by Alan Moore. That's what sold me on it. Uh, the art was done by Scott Clark and Sal Regalia, two artists I'm unfamiliar with. This is from Image Comics, and I'm sure everybody remembers this one from the time. Uh, this is the Spawn Wildcats crossover. Uh, yeah, dramatic music. I didn't so, realize Alan Moore wrote that. For some, for oh, some Alan Moore wrote uh, bunches of Image stuff. Um, you know, he would jump in and write a lot of lot Rob Liefeld's universe stuff. He would mm -hmm. write some Wildcat stuff. He didn't do any. He he didn't. He did some a couple of Spawn things, but not much. If you'd have handed this to me and said and just told me to read it and then asked me if you if you'd have told me to read that and then say, you know, that the person who wrote that is a very very famous comic book writer. Alan Moore would not have been the person I thought wrote this story. This feels absolutely <laughs> nothing like an Alan Moore story. It feels like your typical cookie cutter 1990s comic book story. There's no, there's nothing to it. There is nothing to this. It's fluff and it's bad fluff. It's not fun. It's tedious to read. The story and the dialogue sucks. I cannot believe Alan Moore wrote this story. I just, what was going on with Alan Moore at the time when he wrote this? He must have been on the verge of getting evicted from his apartment or something when he wrote this story, needing money so bad. It was awful. <laughs> well, <laughs> Alan Moore is not somebody I ever think of as being the type of writer who will just take a paycheck, but there have been a few times where you read something and you're like, oh, like he brought something Alan Moore to it, but this was just a paycheck for him. And that might this was off. This. this was so bad. Yeah. This was so bad. And it was it wasn't just a mediocre story that someone did for a paycheck. I mean, it's legitimately difficult to read. It's so bad. It's just stupid. You know, but I mean, that was the trend at the time yeah. <laughs> in the nineties. So don't read that one. I I'm I was gonna pass. Actually, you know, I yeah. thought about going back and, and finding it. Yeah, but I, don't. I'll, I'll pass. I'll take your advice on that one. Yeah, don't do it. There, there's, there's other Alan Moore things to read. I am, I'm not familiar with those two artists either. That um, they're they look like '90s comic book artists. Yeah, they are very '90s comic book artists. Was it more Spawn heavy or more Wildcat heavy? It was well. I mean, it was 50 50. I'd have to say it was 50 50. Okay. Kind of an even split. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm not going to go into the story of this, Caleb. <laughs> you can't, you are not going to trick me into that. On paper, Alan Moore writing Spawn sounds actually pretty amazing. Uh, I would love that if he put his heart into it. But sure. Uh, honestly, I'm not interested in reading. And maybe this is just because of the type of Alan Moore books that I've read, but the idea of Alan Moore writing a superhero team book, just not really interesting to me. Um, well, have you read League? Yeah, I've read League. I, I don't think of that as, and, and maybe I should, but I've never really thought of that as quote unquote superheroes because it's not capes and tights. I think he's having fun with more like literary characters with that. Uh, but I guess yeah. like, yeah, you're right. It is, it is a superhero team book. It's just better than most <laughs> oh it's amazing league was amazing um but i don't know what happened to that ellen moore with this one <laughs> paycheck uh you know <laughs> i mean it reeks of that man it reeks of that those dudes were well and there's a lot in that early 90s image stuff that 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 smells of such 
Um, those dudes had a lot of money and they were throwing it around at anybody who would take it. <laughs> so, yeah, man. Um, mainly because I think on some level they wanted to go spend their money and they did, they didn't no longer they weren't interested in putting out product, uh, which you can tell by the the way the, the frequency of which those things came out. <laughs> so, yeah. Ugh. Um, you know, Alan Moore saw money on the ground and he picked it up. And what fell out when he bent over was Spawn and Wildcats, apparently. Ooh. Uh, well, the, those things happen. Well, I'm sorry it wasn't a really good like reading experience for you, though. No, it was not a good one, but it was an experience. Yeah. So learn from your mistakes, kids. I certainly have. Don't don't trust Matt. When he tells you the proprietor, when he tells you to well, read something. <laughs> no, and he did, he certainly did not hand this to me saying, I think you'll enjoy this. He handed it to me and says, I'll sell you this for a dollar. <laughs> I said, okay, it was a light, you know, it was a light week. I need something else to read for the show. So this will be an experience. <laughs> and boy, was it an experience. <laughs> Uh, how, how do you feel waking up on Sunday morning with that under, on your belt? Um, relieved that I can leave it behind. Uh, fun times. Well, this was normally the point that Craig throws his short stack in here, but we were, I'm, I'm trying to adjust to a lack of Craig. This is interesting. Yeah. Uh, one Craig short. We are, we're exactly one Craig short, um, which should be our new measurement. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Did you did you happen to get the 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 round table book read? Is that something certainly you did. did you did? I knew you did. I felt it in my heart. Um, I did as well. And so there is a book that came out this week uh, that we decided we would both read and we would talk about as we usually do. Right? That's kind of the way that uh, that we like to do things. Um, again, I always think of like an episode. I, I feel like I'm redundantly explaining these things, but I think of each episode as like the first episode for somebody. So um, just to kind of lay out the forecast of what we're going to talk about, what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to do what we call a roundtable book, and we are going to – it's something we've both read. We're going to talk about it, discuss it, um, break it down for you, and then we're going to go into books that uh, each one of us read that the other didn't most likely, um, which is always fun because that kind of gives you a singular perspective and lets us know what we're reading. Um, so, you know, buckle up, buckle in for that. Again, like I said earlier, um, spoilers on all of these things. They're newer books. You might not have read them yet, uh, but there's no way we can really discuss them with without spoiling some things. So, um, you know, check the show notes. <laughs> See, I, I've been putting the time signatures there um, because, I, you know, I, I've learned lessons from getting yelled at in the past. And I learned from my mistakes, kind of like Alan Moore did. So basically, I'm Alan Moore, is what we're what we're saying. Mm. That's, that's don't what say I that about your don't say that about yourself. <laughs> that is a <laughs> that's something I can never live up to. Um, but this week we decided to read. It's a new book. It's from Image Top Cow, uh, and it was a lot of fun. It's called A Man Among Ye. It is written by Stephanie Phillips, who you may know from The Butcher of Paris, drawn by Craig Cermak, uh, with. Uh, colors i forgot what the word colors was um so, <laughs> so had to trip over my tongue with that um britney pazilio with letters by troy pateri um before we before we break into it what do you think about this bud i did not dislike it um i was not you know overly enthused by the time i finished the story um it certainly wasn't a bad quality in any way shape or form it just feels like it's written for somebody else yeah I, I really liked it, um, and I I mean, I, I can explain why, and I will. Uh, on the paper, I liked it in a different way than I liked Butcher of Paris. So, and again, I, I don't think you should judge, like all writers have, uh, they have tells, they have themes, and you, when you read them, you're like, oh, like this, you know, kind of like you said, mostly you can tell an Alan Moore book when you read an Alan Moore book. And I think that's true of most writers. Um, having only read butcher of Paris by Stephanie, uh, Phillips, I, I kind of was expecting something more akin to that. And that's not what this was, but in saying that, I don't mean that in a bad way. I think she just took a different story and a different history. Um, and, and went is, is going for a different type of narrative, which turned out to be really fun. Um, on you know at the, at the base level you're reading a book about pirates and shit how can you not have fun with that um <laughs> that's it's it's good times 
So you want me to you want me to kind of lay it out for him? Yep, do it. All right, man. So the story opens uh, like all high seas adventures should. A pirate ship is taking over and sacking a British ship, and this is this is the Caribbean, man. These are literally the pirates of the Caribbean who made that that time and that space famous. Uh, and so this ship is captained by a a legendary figure, somebody if you've read any history of that that era you've heard of, and it's Captain Jack Rackham, uh, who is um, like I said, he's a very storied individual, and he is he's leading the charge, man. He's they they are they're taking no quarter or they're giving no quarter and they're taking no prisoners. They're just kind of slaughtering these English sailors. Um, but, but Jack is a, he's a hothead, right? Like he's the kind of guy who he's in his own little world. He's never really looking behind him. And while he's on this pirate ship, he's, you know, he's looking forward and he's not watching his flank and a British sailor kind of gets ready to, to shove a bayonet and put it on the inside of him where it doesn't belong, uh, where it will bring pain and sadness. Um, and right at the last minute, a gunshot rings out and hits this British sailor just square between the eyes. And dude just, you know, he falls down dead because that's what happens when you get shot in the face. Um, but Jack turns around and he starts looking around and he looks up. And on the, I don't know what you really call them, the ropes uh, that, that kind of act like a net that people climb up and down. I mean, you, you've seen pirate movies. Um, there is a, a gorgeous redheaded pirate woman um, hanging off of them holding a pistol. And she's just, she's letting Jack, she's giving him the business, like, hey, aren't you glad my aim is good? You know, I saved your life again. I'm having to do this all the time. Um, and this is Anne Bonny, who is also a storied pirate of the time, based on a real figure. Um, and so the two of them kind of fight their way through the blood, muck, and carnage to to meet up on the ship, um, you know, have a little conversation Little, little little banter, little friendly ha-has right in the middle of everybody getting slaughtered. Um, you know, like pirates do. <laughs> and so when it's all said and done with, they've got their gold, they've got their treasure, and Bonnie walks off the ship and just burns the whole thing. Um, leaves it leaves it blazing. It's it's gone. They're, they're, she has sunk in the evidence. Um, and they've got their money, they've got their gold, their coin, and they are getting ready to head back to Nassau, uh, which is kind of the, the pirate hub so to speak, of the of the Caribbean. But all is all is not necessarily well and good on on the ship. Uh there is some dissension in the ranks. Apparently the crew, uh, I say apparently and you get you get a taste of this in the story, the crew is not really happy about the fact that there is number one, a woman on board the ship. No matter how uh no matter how deserving she is of being there, and make no mistake, she is as ruthless, as cunning, and as bloodthirsty as any of the other men, but she's she's a woman, and it's bad luck to have it on the ship, and she's also getting preferential treatment from, uh, from Rackham, uh, because they're a couple in some sense, um, and they, they don't like the special treatment that she's getting, they don't like, number one, they're, they're a little pissed, they're getting outclassed in piracy by this, by this woman, but they're also a little pissed because she gets treated better than any of them, and she doesn't have to do all of the kind of the bullshit work. She's not swabbing the deck and all that fun stuff. So they're they're kind of walking off. And what you what you learn from this is that a a British governor who is about fed up with Rackham and about fed up with piracy in general has started putting out hits um, on pirate captains. In fact, he's he's saying to people, "Hey, if you." If you if you happen to be a pirate and you turn in Jack Rackham, you turn in any of these people who are making my life a living hell, I'll get you a royal pardon. Like we won't hang you with them. You'll get to like you get to a blank slate. You'll get off scot free. Uh, and that's enticing to some people who might want to go live a better life and you know walk away with a treasure chest full of gold and uh, doubloons <laughs> and and whatnot. What you know become rich men uh, without warrants on them. And so this is kind of circulating among the deck uh, and among the, the men, which is going to lead to a mutiny, right? Like that's the only way it can go. Um, in the midst of all this, there is a stowaway who has hopped off the British ship and you start seeing this figure lurking around, but you really don't, you don't know a lot about this person. Like you don't get a name um, until later on in the story, but you just know they're not supposed to be there. Um... Stephanie Phillips then takes us to Nassau, and she gives us a look of what, of what this town, 
looks like and the politics of this town and kind of gives you a feel for which was an interesting thing for her to do because it gives you a feel for the fact that the governor respects Jack like he wants him dead um he he does not like him he hates him as a matter of fact but he is not willing to underestimate Jack because he respects him as an adversary uh somebody that he really wants to kill because he's met him before and he's been outsmarted by him before. And so this is not, um, if you're unfamiliar with Jack Rackham or any of these characters, they're not idiots. They, they are not, um, there are a lot of things and they lay it out for you. You know, they're thieves and they're murderers and they're drunkards, but they're smart and they're savvy, especially like the sea is their, it's theirs. Uh, and, and they are, they have the ability and the capacity to exist there and to outsmart, some of the ba some of the best naval minds, um, and really what you find out and what the governor comes down to is uh, he has to, in order to beat the pirates, he's got to kind of think like the pirates. He's got to commit some piracy of his own. He's going to have to lie, cheat, and steal his way. Uh, and, and that's really going to be the only way he's able to capture Jack. Uh, so the book, where kind of the book closes, um, goes back to the ship, and you, you see... There's a party going on. Uh, the, the soldiers are, they're, they're singing, uh, you know, what should we do with a drunken sailor? Everybody's drunk. Everybody's having a good time. Um, and this this kid, this figure that, that you saw climbing the boat is starting to sneak around, but he gets spotted. And inevitably he gets he gets caught and they, they throw him in the brig. Um, and as the sailors continue to get drunk, um, they decide they want to go goad this person. And, and I'll say this boy, he is a boy uh, by all appearances he's frail he's young um, very youthful and so they go in there and they're just kind of picking at him a little bit uh, and they're 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 shit-faced by this point and they're trying to goad him into a fight because look this is these are hearty men of the sea and they are about to beat this boy senseless um, so they get the keys they open it up and they're they're fixing to just jump him when Anne Bonnie opens the door and she's just like, hey, like you, you're having a brawl and you didn't invite me? That's some bullshit. Uh, you know I love these things. And they are, you know, filled with liquid courage and well within their cups. And so they decide this is the moment that they're going to teach this woman who, who deigns and dares to be on their ship a lesson. Uh, but but Anne Bonnie is not one to be fucked with <laughs> at, at all. Um, you know, she draws her saber, she's quick, and she just really lays it out for these guys and gives them what for, you know, uh, as I, I'm pointing my fist and shaking because that's what you do when you say something like gives them what for. Um, and she kind of gets in between them and the boy, the kid, uh, and she's just like, if, you, if you're going to, you know, you're going to hurt this child, almost a motherly kind of way, which is not what I think of when I think of Anne Bonnie. Um, but she's like, to get to them, you're going to have to go through us. And, and she's like, and actually, you, you know, this, what you, what you've been calling a boy is actually a girl. And she takes the kid's hat off and like the hair flows down and it's, it's not a boy at all. It's actually a young girl. Um, and if you read the back matter and you read into the story, you actually find out that this is Mary Reed, uh, who is, uh, well, before we say who she is, um, Matt, how much, how much pirate history are you familiar with? I would say slightly more than the average bear. Okay. So if I'm not mistaken, um, and I had to brush up on some of this, but there are two women um, who were ever convicted and sentenced to death for piracy on the high, on the quote unquote high seas. And that is Anne Bonnie and Mary Reed. Um, I don't, do you know if there was ever any more or am I? Um, I mean, not that I know of. Those are the, the by far the two most famous. Yeah, um, and so infamous. They were they. I mean, they were women who were convicted, and and you know, very rarely were women ever sentenced to death, especially not in the the you know, was this the sixteenth or seventeenth century? Um, unless they were witches. Yeah, unless they were witches, that's a whole different story. Those weren't women; they were just demon spawn. Um, but no, so they. But these two women were in fact historically convicted, and they were sentenced to be to be hung um there's a lot of legend about these women uh they some say that they were never known to be women until they were arrested that only a few people knew that they dressed as men they lived as men um they acted as men uh, in a very male driven male oriented piracy society um other stories say that no they they were known to be women but they 
gain the respect, and they were under the watchful eye of their captains, who were also their lovers. Um, you know, Jack Rackham and Anne Bonny were a couple. Um, Jack Rackham and Mary Reed, at one point, were a couple. He's the connective tissue between both of those people. But there's also a lot of legend, a lot of story, and a lot of notes that suggest that Anne Bonny and Mary Reed were a couple themselves. Um, that they were lesbians, and they, you know, they work together and live together. But we don't know the full scope of that. What we do know is that at least Mary Reed escaped being hung. Um, she died in prison, but she escaped being hung because she was pregnant. Um, she got pregnant right before she was convicted. Uh, and she was able to to skip the trip to the gallows because of that. Um, and it's, you know, most people think that it was probably Jack Rackham's child. Uh so interesting, interesting history, interesting story. Stephanie Phillips does a really good job with these type of um, historical narratives. Like, like you know, if you go into Butcher of Paris, kind of something very similar. Um, I I dug this story, which I like pirates. Uh, I, I think pirates are, and I know that's a very childish thing to say, but I think child like pirates, there's something uniquely... Um, exciting about pirates, right? And and it doesn't matter if you're talking about pirates uh, from the Caribbean or piracy being done up, you know, in the Norwegian areas with the Vikings, um, pirates in the South Chinese seas, uh, or even off the coast of Africa today is, as, which is kind of one of the, in the Indian Ocean, one of the last bastions of, of active piracy. I mean, they give people fits, um, even though they're terrible people and they do terrible things, there's something enticing about pirates, uh, no matter where they're at. And I think I think it's a fun story. I think it's a fun thing to look at, uh, especially when they're based on actual figures. Yeah, I mean, I I like the pirate history the same reason I like um, any given type of uh, true crime. Right. I mean, it's a it's a true crime genre. The pirate pirate history is really interesting. How <clears throat> I guess you could use the term progressive pirate culture was mm -hmm. um, because in any given pirate ship, everybody every part of the crew got an equal share of the loot right. every, of the raid, and that includes the captain. Uh, generally, the captain did not get a greater share of the loot than the uh, guy swabbing the deck. Um, it's also interesting, it was also interesting to learn that if you were a member of a pirate crew and you were injured um, while on, you know, on duty, I guess you would say, you were still paid the same share as if you weren't. <laughs> You for, yeah, I mean they had a they had a workers' compensation plan on the pirate ships. I didn't know that part. That's mm. amazing. You know, and if you you know if you really stop and think about it, I mean that's kind of the that's the kind of thing that uh, you're going to have to offer if you want somebody to join a pirate crew. I mean, being right. the a member a member of a pirate crew, I mean you're living on a boat you know, for an indefinite amount of time, you don't know when you're going to find land, let alone get off the boat, you know? So for people to live under those conditions, you, you better be compensating them well. And, and, and they automatically, yeah. you know, like you, there, there, this is, there's no due process for pirates at this time. So if you're, if you're a member of a pirate crew, if you're on a pirate ship, it's automatic death. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, you, you have to have those incentives to get people to, to come back um, and and to join in with that because, again, this is not, you know, you get caught stealing something from the marketplace. You go to court, you know, have some cabbage thrown at you, and, you know, worst case scenario, you get your hand cut off, which is a bad case scenario. I'm not saying not, but, um, <laughs> like, that's severe. Or you get thrown in prison and you're treated terribly. But with piracy, it's instant death because you're inherently, and the reason it was is because pirates – they fuck up the flow of commerce. But it's a crime against a crime. It's a crime against the crown. Right. So yeah, it's treason. Essentially it's treason. Absolutely. And that's what makes these so like, it makes it so deadly and dangerous. Um, 
but also it's it's you know edge of your seat kind of storytelling. Um, I think I think Stephanie Phillips did a really good job. I, I will say, um, in the spirit of fairness and in spirit of criticism, so to speak, have you ever seen the show Black Sails? I have not. I have been told that I'm missing out. So Black Sails heavily features a character named Jack Rackham, heavily features character named Ann Bonnie <laughs> and Mary Reed. Uh, at the, well, no, it doesn't feature heavily Mary Reed. Mary Reed does play a part in it, but she is outside of it, the story. Um, this, this felt like it was an episode. Uh, in fact, the, if you, if you go to IMDB, um, the person, the actor who played Jack Rackham really does favor the per the way that they drew him in this. Like it mm. felt like I was reading an episode of that. Um, now this, the character that plays Anne Bonnie, um, she was shown to be a redhead in the television show and she's shown that here, but this, this Anne Bonnie is an, is way more feminine, um, than that Anne Bonnie was, uh, which which is more feminine in, in the comic? Um, she was way more mm. feminine in the comic. The Anne Bonnie in the show was not. She was, she was, she presented herself as a woman. She wasn't, she wasn't hiding as a man. But she was not what you would call feminine. Um, I wouldn't think any given female pirate would would exude traditional feminine <laughs> features. No, no. And, and I, I would, like I said, in in <clears throat> history, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of context that that suggests that they may have been um, what we would call today trans, uh, but they were living as men and presenting as men. But in the comics, she's drawn, you know, she's, she's showing cleavage. She's got curves. She's very voluptuous, um, which, which kind of made the story. Um, and when you couple that with, with Cermak's art and which is, which is, I, this is not a knock. I think the art is fantastic. It was dynamic. It was fun. It, but, but this felt like something I would expect to read at dynamite. And not so much an image book, which it did feel like a dynamite book. I, yeah. I thought the same. Um, which is which is again not a knock. I read a lot of dynamite books. I love dynamite. It just you know image their <clears throat> the way that they make comics and the way that they pr produce things is they let people come to them with a finished product and they say okay we'll put our stamp on it um, and we'll help you publish it for uh, you know for ten percent or whatever it is. Um, but sometimes and so I, I don't think that there is a quote unquote house style for image. But with a lot of image uh, books being creator owned, and I think you get a lot more artists who are outside of the the quote unquote norms. Um, you know, like like oh oh, what was the you know Tartarus? Jack T. Cole is not a comic artist that you're going to see. Uh, his style is not fit for Marvel, um, and it, it 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 will not fit in well at DC. Um, you know, you get Trad Moore who has his own thing, who has done some work for Marvel, but that was after he became Trad Moore. Um, you know, you kind of get these people who are pushing the boundaries and the expectations of comics. And this was, this is just good comics. Like this is, this is very much a, something that you would expect to see from comics. Um, like it, it's, it's tra traditional in a sense. It looks kind of like a house style. And again, that's not a knock. It's beautiful. Um, but it's like like it, it would fit in better, I think, at a publisher like Dynamite um, than it does at at Image. Which so it, well, Dynamite does a lot of fictionalized history too, so that's re you know yeah um, absolutely. And just as a in in, in trend to be transparent, I'm really not into fictionalized history mm -hmm. by and large. It's, you know, I'll, I'm a history buff, so if you give me a fictionalized history story. I'm just complete. It's hard to get me engaged in that kind of material. Yeah. Well, and I, knowing you for years, uh, you're the kind of person who you prefer a documentary to a dramatic, uh, unveloping of a story. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. like I, like, you know, we, we've had that conversation a hundred times outside of the podcast, but you, you almost rather watch a documentary. Um, in any given I am moment, to a point. Yeah. Uh, but I also don't mind, especially if it's something I don't know a lot about, I don't mind the dramatization of history. As long as it's not um, bullshitted, so to speak. And so far in this book, A Man Among You, nothing I've read is bullshit. Uh, and so that, that helps it out. Um, but you get into, and this is more contemporary history, but say, for instance, the uh, the Queen movie that came out um, 
what was that called? Queen movie? Yeah, there was a movie about Freddie Mercury that came out a few years ago. Um, oh. Uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. Yeah. Um, it, it really great movie, but the way they presented Queen's performance at at Live Aid, they presented it as the last hurrah after he found out that he had HIV and he was dying and he knew it was going to be his last thing, so he gave it his all uh, because it was his last chance at achieving some like musical greatness. And that's bullshit. Um, he played Live Aid before he found out, like before he was diagnosed. His performance at Live Aid, Freddie Mercury's performance at Live Aid was just amazing because Freddie Mercury was amazing. And he was like like that group, that that part of the concert was the the most memorable. It was the the best. But that's just because that he was theatrical in nature and he put all of his heart into it anyway. Um, and so I get aggravated when I find out stuff like that about dramatized history um, because it's like you're painting the wrong picture um, but in this in this book I didn't notice anything uh, breaking any hardline storytelling um, well anything. it's definitely I mean it's this is definitely taking historical characters and creating a fictional story oh, out of the yeah. real characters. And that's what I mean by fictionalized history, not, not the retelling of, <clears throat> not the retelling of history. Uh, take when I said fictionalized history is taking real characters and putting them in a story that never occurred in a fake situation. Yeah. yeah. That's what I really, that really just turned me off. Um, but, uh, that's just a personal hang up. It's got nothing to do with quality. Right. I get that. And I think, well, and you know, that's fair. Um, but so those problems, like issues like that aside though, um, if you do like history and I think pirate stories, like especially this story is, is really, it's almost a perfect scenario for that. Even, even if you don't like it, because we don't know a whole lot about these characters. Um, there is a book that came out, uh, you know, 120 years ago or so called The History of Pirates about these figures. Um, and it, it's, it's encyclopedic. It reads, it's, it's literally telling you about the actual um, figures such as Jack Rackham and Anne Bonny and Blackbeard and all of those folks. Um, and that's kind of the only thing we know about them. Um, and so for us to not, to know that they existed, but to not know... Uh, and not have writings that, that give us a day-to-day -day accounting, um, mainly because they were <laughs> criminals and they didn't want to keep evidence. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I think that makes it ripe for really creative storytelling, really really fun and energetic and um, histor his uh, historical to a point storytelling. So I, I probably will stay on this. Um, again, just because I love these characters and I love who they were in history. I, like I said, I... I love Black Sails. I think it's a great show. And even it did that thing that I hated. Um, it took pirates who were a hundred years apart and made them friends. Um, oh gosh. Yeah. So, and, and that part, like that part is annoying to me, but I can suspend <laughs> my disbelief for the, for the sake of a show. Um, also because See, that, feel, that feels like cheating to me when you do things like that. Oh, it is. Uh, it's totally cheating. That's, that's what, that's what really bugs me when you, you take characters that in no way, shape or form ever cross paths and you, you know, that really does feel like a, yeah, whatever. It, I mean, yes, it is cheating, but I, I think of it this way. Um, think of Tarzan and John Carter of Mars, um, written by the same person, but supposed to be in way two different universes in two different times. Those characters should never meet. Um, but when I read, and I don't know why I've been hung up on this book for the past two weeks. This is the second time in two weeks I've mentioned it. But when I read Bill Willingham's Greatest Adventure, and I get to see Tarzan and John Carter of Mars on the same page together, working together, I just get kind of giddy. Like, it makes me happy. Um, and those characters are not, they were never alive. They're not real people. And I understand that they don't have the historical, uh, they don't share a historical reality so I can see them on the page and see them interact together and it just be dumb, fun, uh, you know, fictional adventure. To a point, I can suspend my disbelief and my knowledge of history to a point to where I can see, you know, Blackbeard the pirate hanging out with Jack Rackham, even though those two men lived 
you know, decades apart, um, from what I understand, um, because it is exciting to to see them, uh, you know, and especially if it's just given to you and they don't try any sci-fi bullshit with time travel <laughs> when it happens, no. uh, which you know that that's a thing that happens. Um, you know, you give me a story on some level that has Queen Elizabeth. And maybe she gets to meet um, Joan of Arc. Oh, like, God. See, that, I could that just... see that being turned into a fun story that I could find enjoyment oh. in, even though those those characters never had opportunity to meet or exist at the same God, time. I would, see, I'm the opposite. I would just, oh, God, that would just make me want to beat my head against a wall. It's just like, it feels like exploitation and laziness on an author's part. Like, instead of creating your own world and your own characters, you're taking you're taking something and throwing it together because there's, there's already interest built into that. You know, feel, that's why it feels like cheating to me. It's because you're taking something that the work has already been done. There's already interest built and you're using that to bring people into your story instead of the, letting your own creative work bring people into the story. Yeah. Uh, and again, I see that point on, and, and like I said, when it comes to certain things, I share that when it comes to other things, I just get kind of excited about the potential of juxtaposing two historical figures together and seeing, seeing creatively how you could, you can reconcile their very real and known personas with how they would interact with each other. I think that I find that to be interesting, um, an interesting storytelling aspect, because if you don't do it, if you don't get the characterizations right, those same people who are, who have that built in interest and who love it are going to ring you out. Like they are going to run you through the rails, um, for not getting the persona right. Even if you're telling a story about how they existed with somebody who like it was impossible. So you're almost like, there's a risk to it that almost demands you have done your homework on it, so to speak. And so that's where I can find, uh, some type of enjoyment, some type of fun with it. But again, like I completely get from the other aspect of it, how it's like, it's just frustrating because you can't take somebody from a specific time um, and take them out of the context of that time and expect them to be the same person and juxtapose them with somebody else. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, six, one, half a dozen, the other uh, it's, it's a give and take. So the story better be there if you're going to do that, just kind of where I land on it. But yeah, um, so what are you going to stick around with this book? Is it going on the pull list? No, nah, I'm uh, think I'm a one and done on this one. Okay. Um, I'll probably check it out. Like I said, I, I love Anne Bonnie. Um, and my, my love of, of black sales, uh, is really going to push me through to check out the second issue of this and see where they go. Um, plus pirates. I'm going to go sit in the bathtub and read this and splash with my action figures. Plus pirates. <laughs> Uh, I feel like Plus Pirates is probably the name of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Caleb Matt Plus Pirates. Plus Pirates. Can you do it? Can you do a pirate arg? How's your pirate arg? Oh God, it would pale in comparison to historical accuracy. So I don't know. I, would I feel betray, like you probably I would, have a good would, pirate arg in you. You look like somebody who could arg with the best of them. <laughs> yeah, um, well, <laughs> but at least I present well. You do. <laughs> you do. Um, Speaking of presenting well, what did you read this week, brother? So my book of the week is actually a book that I thought had come to an end. I was surprised when I got the issue this week from Image Comics, uh, from Brian Azzarello and Eduardo Risso, uh, Moonshine number 18. You know, when uh, number 17, you know, said the end at the end. So I was like, okay, it's the end. Not so much. Apparently that was just the end of that arc. And we start a new arc with issue number 18 and which has in short, the female protagonist of the story for those that are unfamiliar with this moonshine is the story of some uh, mafioso in the prohibition era who go to the Appalachians to strike a deal to buy moonshine from some uh, distillers living in the hills as they were wont to do. So they were buying, you know, they, they were striking a deal with this family of moonshiners in the Appalachians to supply the market in Chicago, New York, 
and the like. Mm -hmm. Well, come to find out um, these, the most popular and most successful moonshiners that could supply the mob with what they need. Uh, were also a family of werewolves <laughs> and uh, shenanigans ensued. So the female protagonist of this family is a very attractive uh, woman in what looks to be her mid twenties. Uh, she becomes friendly with one of the gangsters. And in this arc, she has decided to go to Chicago uh, to try to get revenge upon the gangsters who ended up betraying her family uh, while they were in cahoots for moonshine. Well, interestingly, and this is kind of ties into what we were just talking about. Interestingly, this arc is going to involve some actual mafioso from the prohibition area oh, uh, nice. era. Uh, most notably, Lucky Luciano, Charles mm -hmm. Lucky Luciano, and Joe Masseria. Um, I, being a aficionado of gangster history and organized crime, immediately recognized. Of course, they're t you know who they're referring. They don't refer to Lucky Luciano as him as such in this story, but I figured out that's who it was. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. So this is gonna this is going to be a fictionalized version of the interaction between this moonshining family of werewolves and uh, Lucky Luciano and Joe Masseria. So this is going to be quite the thing uh, to see what Brian Azzarello and Eduardo Risso do with this. The art in this book is what it always is when Eduardo Risso does it. It's outstanding. It's so good. Um, I so love good. his, his art style. So it is, I'm very anxious to see where this goes, frankly, mostly because of Eduardo Risso. Um, it feel, you know, I was a little bummed when I found out this was going to be a, again, a fictionalized telling of historical figures because that stuff immediately turns me off, but I'm going to stick on this book because of Eduardo Risso. Yeah. Um, I just, I have a really hard time walking away from this book because of his storytelling. It's so good. Well, and the fact, like you said, they, and so this makes me think because they don't come out and say that it's, uh, it's like a Luciano, they, Eduardo Riso and uh, Brian Azzarello, they leave you that texture in the story to let you figure it out if you know that's who it is. Um, that bodes well uh, because they're not doing exactly what you talked about. They're not leaning into the, the built-in fandom that comes with a name. Uh, that's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I can't, you know, it doesn't feel, when you're talking about characters like this, it doesn't, that doesn't feel like you're trying to uh, leverage popularity because this is, these are criminals that lived back in the 1920s. Right. Not exact, not exactly, you know, literary figures to leverage popularity with. Um, so it didn't, it doesn't, it doesn't come across that way just because of the nature of the story and the nature mm -hmm. of the people it contains. But uh, it's still just kind of one of those, it's just one of my hangups when you take these real people and put them in these fictionalized stories, but we'll see where it goes. Um, you know, the first arc was pretty, you know, the first arc, the first 17 issues of moonshine were, were pretty damn good. Uh, and, but I'll say yeah, the heavy lifting to, for me personally has been done by uh, Eduardo Risso, not Brian Azzarillo. Well, I mean, in most things, in most situations where Eduardo, Eduardo Riso is on a book, that's going to be true. I mean, that dude is just ridiculous. Like what yeah, he does to a page don't make no kind of sense. He's great, man. He's got a, you know, he's got a very, he's got a very unique style. Um, yeah. He's got a very unique style. That's compelling to look at. There's I mean, no doubt about it. 100 bullets is probably one of my favorite series of all times. Yeah. Um, 100 bullets is great. His, so yeah, I don't know. He's a, it's a hard, he's a hard guy to put into words on why his art is compelling. There's a lot of artists that, you know, most of the time it's easy to put into words why an artist's work is compelling. His is difficult. He's just got a way of drawing people. It's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, I think because he shows the complexities of real life. Um, 
and he's not trying to, he, he does it by not being, uh, real. Like he, he doesn't lean on realism. Um, and, but you still get so much of the texture of who these people, people are in those lines. Uh, well, he's definitely one of these artists that is extremely good at drawing, um, emotion on somebody's face. He's very good at yeah. that. Um, but he doesn't those take a hundred lines to do it. Like he, no, he's a yeah. It's minim, minimal, minimal lines. And he's he draws. A, he's, very he puts a lot of yeah. economy of line. Yeah, he puts a lot, lots and lots of thought into the facial expressions and the posturing of characters on the page to convey a lot through, um, to convey a lot through a nonverbal means. You know, if you were, you know, to put it another way. And there's some artists that are great at doing that. Uh, Juan Fier Ferreira is another mm -hmm. one. Uh, he's really good at that. You know, and you. You know, you appreciate that a lot right after you've read something like the Spawn Wildcats crossover. <laughs> <laughs> really um, leaps off the page. Well, I mean, like those exact things, you know, that like it, everything you just explained is why Darwin Cook is one of my favorite artists of all time. Um, mm -hmm. Because he, he could do that. Uh, and there's a new guy. I, I say new. That's a, I, I use that term relatively. He's new onto my radar. Um, I just found him over the last year or so. Uh, a guy named Victor Santos, um, who I bought one of his books. I have to let you borrow it. But if you're not familiar with Victor Santos, go go Google his his artwork. Um, he does a lot of that as well, and has a very is very um, stylistically akin to uh, what Eduardo Riso does. Not not again. It's it's within the family tree, not necessarily on the same branch, but you know has the same root. Mm -hmm. um, so go check him out. Um, now you say you're an aficionado of crime, um, uh, or no, let me rephrase that. You said you were a gangster aficionado. Do you have a favorite gangster? Uh, I don't have a favorite because these people were criminal dirt bags. Yeah, yeah I'm, using uh, air, I'm using air quotes so, when I say that. I, well, um, and I say that because way too often the, uh, mafia criminals are glorified, right? And people turn them into heroes, mm -hmm. and that really turns my stomach. Uh, John Gotti's a perfect example. Uh, people want to glorify, you know, the latest John Gotti movie starring John Travolta tried to paint him as this neighborhood hero who threw his finger up to the man. And that kind of stuff burns my ass because these people are violent criminals. Yeah. Um, I don't have one that I guess I would say really stands out about above the others as being you know, Lucky Luciano is a very interesting person because he he created the mafia as it exists ever well ever since then. So he was a very he was a very interesting person. Um, I just don't use the word favorite. Right. <laughs> so, and I know what you meant, but I want to make sure and make it clear that I do not. As these are people, these are fascinating. It's a fascinating world to me. True crime is a is 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 a fascinating subject, and organized crime especially whether it's the mafia or the illicit drug trade. Mm -hmm. um, so lucky Luciano is probably the one that uh, I tend to my ears perk up. If there's something about him on the history channel or something is just because of the impact that he had on the world itself and um, how he ap approached crime in such a different way than any, than any of his uh, counterparts did up until that point. It's like, how did he manage to herd? all these feral cats. I right. mean, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I think if I had to pick one uh, that I have enjoyed learning about that I find interesting, it was Bugsy Siegel. Um, Bugsy Siegel is a character that, again, despicable, um, but terrifying and, and interesting. Yeah, well, that's the thing is the world is full of terrifying and interesting characters. That's... I mean, yeah. these people are, you know, they're vicious killers, vicious, and they present themselves as clean cut, you know, um, presentable rub elbows with celebrities type people. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you got, you know, the uh, rubbing elbows with the likes of, uh, well, Frank Sinatra for one. Yeah. You know, I mean, well, and I think that, that exact aspect is what I do find so fascinating and interesting about them because this isn't crime that's being done 
in its own uh, vacuum, like it's not crime that's being done that doesn't affect the lives of everyday people. When you when you come into talking about gangsters and the mafia, and and organized crime in that sense, you know, even if like coming out of prohibition, that had a direct impact on how American governance was done and how our cities formed. Like like Bugsy Siegel, for instance, like he's the kind of like he's the person I like to I have I've enjoyed learning about. Las Vegas, like the way that Las Vegas is today, like, and I'm not, I don't mean like the culture of Las Vegas, which is also could be said to be true, but literally the architecture and the landscape and the layout of that city, Bugsy Siegel, a gangster, a murderer, a despicable man is almost like, like it doesn't exist without him. Those buildings do not get built without him. Um, the relationship of gangsters to the Teamsters. Uh, like, you know, you don't get movies made, but you also don't get uh, construction done without the mob. And so from that aspect, I find, like, I find it intriguing. Like, it's it's corruption at its truest form, but it's still fun to re read about in the light of history. And I just, you know, even though I know it does happen, it does exist today, I would prefer it not to. Um, I like yeah. to think of it as historical. When, um, when Bugsy Siegel died, the land that he was trying to purchase at the time mm -hmm. in today's money would be worth $14 billion. Yep. Uh, there is a, and I forget which, which person it's attributed to, but there's a building off the coast uh, or I say off the coast. There's a building on the shores of Lake Michigan in Chicago, uh, which it's kind of the furthest building out into the lake that they actually had to like put in land <laughs> to build it on. It does not meet, it breaks almost every code, does not meet any specification. Um, but it is, it exists and it's the, like the most noticeable thing on the shores of Lake Michigan in Chicago. Um, and it's because of the mafia, <laughs> like the, the, somebody wanted the building and they broke all mm -hmm. the rules. They got it done without, um, without all the permits they needed to, like that, mm -hmm. that aspect of it is just fascinating to me. And, and again, worth billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just the direct. And, and I also think part of it, at least I'm not sure if this is true for you, but I know it's true for me. Um, are growing up this close to, um, hot springs, Arkansas. Um, like I hear all the legends and I, I grew up hearing all the stories that came out of hot springs because, um, for anybody who doesn't isn't from Arkansas and you're not from this area, there's a little town that's known for horse racing about 30 minutes outside of Little Rock, 45 minutes depending on how traffic is, and it's called Hot Springs. Um, this town was developed as a site, it, it, gambling arena, um, horse racing, speakeasies. It was a safe zone for the mafia. For years, it was a place where any of the mafia families could come to, and like it was, it was, it broke their laws to do a hit in Hot Springs. Like it didn't matter what battles were going on, who was feuding with with who. If your mafioso criminal family pulled a hit in Hot Springs, then because it was their vacation spot, really, um, then every single one of the families went to war with you, and they just wiped you off the map. Um, Al Capone had an apartment there, like literally with his initials done in gold tile on the floor. Um, and you can go there today and you go to a, a bar that used to be owned by Al Capone, the Ohio bar, and you can still see the bullet holes from when people got drunk and crazy. You can still walk down into the, you know, to, into the speakeasy part um, where they were like the, the underground casino was that was ran by the mafia um, there. Like, and just being this close to just part of that real history, I've, I've always found it fascinating. Yeah, it's interesting. If you're ever if you're from out of state and you ever need a place to vacation, um, and you want something that is literally within walking distance of, you know, just kind of a booming downtown, small town, uh, uh, mid-sized town, but also within close distance to nature and hiking trails, but someplace with a rich history, check out Hot Springs. Um, and I'm gonna let them know that we pitched that, and they can send us some money. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a fun place. Uh, well, I guess it's my turn. Um, Matt, you know how sometimes you and I are on the same page um, and we don't know it? No. You, you don't know how that happens? <laughs> um, I am convinced that there is some sort of kismet between you and I that just happens on its own. Um, 
without us without us planning it because the book that I'm going to talk about this week is also a Brian Azzarello book hmm. um, that was a lot of fun and we didn't plan this didn't didn't have it going you know there was no foresight to it at all it's just kind of the way these things work out and that book is none other than Faithless Two Number One uh, it's the second part in this story with art by Maria Lovett. Now I spoke about this book m multiple times last year because it was one of my favorite books of the year. I think it might've actually been um, my favorite book. Uh, Faithless. The, the first part was a um, little background on it. Faith is this uh, in the first story, the first 12 issues. She is this aspiring artist that she's trying to make it. Uh, you know, she's quirky and she's weird. She's figuring herself out. Um, and she meets this young woman who's going to help her figure it out, and they become a couple. Um, then she meets this man, and he is this, you know, world-renowned art uh, influencer, and they become a couple. And then she finds out that the man and the woman are father and daughter, and there's some issues with that, but they all work it out. Long story short, by the end of the arc, Faith is, uh, she she has quote-unquote made it. She's arrived in the scene. She's getting noticed. Um the book presents itself as um, something written in the in the form of the divine comedy. So what you start to realize is that there is literally divine aspects of this, and um, essentially what what happened is Faith had to make a deal with the devil, um, being you know the man that she she met and slept with, who also is a father figure, who also is kind of one of the driving force, and his name is Luis, um, and so that that's where the the lead up gets you to the first part of the story. But in this story now, Faith has, she's made it. She's in the scene um, and there are things expected of her. Um, she has to produce. She She's now on top of the the art world. So she, she better hold that spot. You know, she's got to make art. And of course, with that pressure comes artist block, uh, you know, kind of like writer's block. She's, she's staring at a blank canvas and she doesn't know what to do and nothing's coming to her. Her, her inspiration is gone. Um, Poppy, who was her girlfriend, P O P P Y. Um, uh, she is a model uh, of course, and she is off in, I want to say Milan. Uh, you know, she's, she's the face of Dior. Uh, and so they're not they're, They can't be together. So they kind of teleconference, um, FaceTime and whatever. Um, but Poppy was, was faith's muse for the art that, that really got her attention and got her noticed. Um, other than, you know, making packs with Satan. Uh, but it, it's what put her at, at the top. And she's missing Poppy. Uh, and so they're, as they talk, and not only is she missing her her presence and her voice, she's missing the sex, because the sex was fucking rock and roll. It, it was good stuff. And so as they're sitting here having this conversation, um, you know, Poppy's just like, you know, I, I miss you. I miss the way you smell. I miss your touch, the temperature of your body. Um, you ever thought about doing it long distance? Um, and the two start essentially masturbating together over over FaceTime. This book is is very sexually explicit. I, sh I you know I think that if you read the first arc, you already know that um, it doesn't shy away from presenting itself as as sexually explicit, but it's not pornographic. Um, Azarello and and Maria Lovett they have walked a very fine line with a level of expertise um, that is just to say it's impressive is an understatement because depicting the scenes that they depict and showing the scenes that they show, it could be pornographic and coming from a male writer, it could be exploitive. Um, but it doesn't feel that way in the book. It, it feels natural. Um, it feels instead of being pornographic, uh, I mean, I don't know that it's, it's fair to say it's not pornographic. It's not smut. It's tasteful. Um, and, and I think Maria Lovett's art plays a big role in that because she does bring a feminine touch to it. Um, she brings something noticeably n not male, so uh, not not at least not heterosexual male um, driving force of the aspect. You see the emotion and the, the sensualness involved in it. Um, and all that's a fancy way of saying, hey, these two chicks are rubbing it out with each other on screen. Um, while this is happening, you know, uh, Poppy, um, to add kind of a, another supernatural ethereal flavor to the story, she says, Hey, you're, you know, just want to let you know, you're going to get a visitor soon. Um, and that's foreshadowing <laughs> for, for things to come. And, um, about at the same time, the door opens up and, uh, Solomon, who is a, a friend of, 
of faiths and somebody that goes way back and a fellow artist, a musician, he walks in the door. Um, but also faith gets her, uh, her, her, her menstruation cycle kicks in, her monthly visitor kicks in. So at the same moment, she's digitally making love to her partner. She gets interrupted by her roommate and her period starts. Um, and so she starts to feel embarrassed, uh, you know, as you might, she, turns the TV off and she runs into the bathroom and she's she's crying. But I think the scene, it, it's an incredibly powerful scene because it shows, you know, sex is something that everybody has and we it can be dirty and it can be something we shy away from and we fear from. The same is true about menstruation. The same is true about women's periods. It's something that we, especially from a male perspective, we grew up getting told that this is something you don't talk about. You like, you know, yeah, these are feminine hygiene products. They're not tampons. Uh, instead of just calling them what they are, and it's something that we don't normalize. Um, we kind of think of as as dirty, but they don't have to be. It's it's a natural phenomenon. It's something that that happens to every. Um, to uh, not, it's not fair to say every. It it happens to the majority of women who are, are cisgendered women, um, who have their periods. But it's still in that moment embarrassing. Um, so the night goes on. Um, she actually ends up going back and she meets up with Luis, who again, um, dad slash Satan, um, and they go on a talk show together and there, it's kind of this, uh, letterman type of thing, or Jimmy Kimmel, I guess would be the, um, reference point for the younger generation where they're having this moment, but they're doing this kind of pretentious kind of avant-garde thing where the, the host asks her a question and she whispers it into Luis's ear and Luis answers for her. Um, again, Yes, it's super pretentious, but they're self-aware and they know it. It's all an act. It's it's meant to get people talking because, of course, what's going to be on all the tabloids? What's going to be on all the news? Oh, this this young artist, this, uh, you know, it's kind of like Lady Gaga wearing a suit made out of meat. Um, she knew that that was specifically sending a message, but it was also getting her headlines. And so that's what this whole thing was. It was a stunt, but it, it gives you an insight into the um, the mechanics of PR and the mechanics of the art world and the almost the way that the the public relations people and um people you know artists but also artists agents the way they manipulate public perception and the way that they manipulate public narrative um especially in pop culture um and it seems something as as innocent or quote unquote ridiculous as being on a talk show and and being weird and quirky, but what you realize, like what is what Azarello is showing you, and what Lovett is showing you, is what happens in real life. It's it's the way that these impactful artists really are the puppet masters of pop culture and the pop culture narrative, and, and at least the ones that impact us in any way. I mean, I, you know, I mentioned Lady Gaga, but I also think of people like uh, Marilyn Manson. Uh, you know, the the shenanigans that he pulled um, are meant to to get people talking as much as they are to be noticeable. Um, Kiss, you know, we, we, we brought up Kiss earlier, you know, making a comic book in blood, but also, you know, spitting blood and having the demonic imagery, um, you know, G.G. Allen was just G.G. Allen. I think he actually believed his bullshit, <laughs> so he's not uh, somebody you bring up in here. But, um, you know, again, it, it brings a spotlight and a highlight to the entirety of the story. Um, but at the end of the night, Poppy is just Poppy, and she, or not Poppy, uh, Faith is just Faith, and she feels inadequate, and she's scared that she can't hold on to the limelight, and that she is kind of having imposter syndrome, that she doesn't deserve to be there, that um, she's going to end up being a failure. So she goes back to the apartment, and it, the story kind of wraps up where it began, and she's looking at this blank white canvas, this nothingness, that is just staring at her, daring her to be the artist that um, she's presented herself as. And Solomon walks in, and this is, you know, they've had their little uncomfortable moment before where he walked in and she was naked masturbating with her girlfriend, um, but they kind of have this relationship where those things are, like, they're not weird, <laughs> so they're not they're not even needing to be brought up. And so he's kind of talking to her about, you know, hey, like, you know, I'm a musician, but I feel this the same way from time to time. Um, you know, y you'll get there, something will come loose, you just got to look at it and it, like, realize that it's asking you to, the, the canvas is asking you to mold it into something new and to, to put your experience and your emotions and your sexuality and your sensuality and your anger and your, your fear on it. And until you accept those things and you let them drive you, it's just going to be a blank canvas. Like it's not going to be just like my, my guitar is the same piece of wood and six strings that everybody else can buy, but it takes my, uh, worldview and my aspect and my, um, everything, my, my essence to make a song that only I can craft. 
Um, and so after he drops this beautiful gem of knowledge, he lights up a joint and walks out, and he's going to the bar to have a drink. Um, and Faith falls asleep. But as Faith falls asleep, she starts to have a dream. And the dream literally puts her into the one of the, the circle. Again, I mentioned this is in the vein of um, the Divine Comedy. She wakes up in one of the circles of hell um, in her dream. Um, you know, something akin to purgatory. Possibly, you don't really know where it's at, but everything is... Uh, you know, it, it's tinged in red. It it looks like a hellscape. There is a a mountain of bodies that is bleeding, um, and and these bodies are you know they're, they're men, but they're stark white and statuesque, and they're just gushing blood, almost like stigmata. And then she wakes up, um, and and this moment kind of ties everything together. She walks over to the canvas, and um, you know, again earlier her her period started, and she reaches down into her pants. And she starts painting with her own blood. Um, and Solomon walks up and offers to help her. And that's where this story closes. And the next issue is going to be called A Bloody Good Time. Um, so uh, as the two are making art together with something that came, that you know, where he suggested take the emotions that come out of you, they are now making art together with something that physically comes out of her. Which has been done before. I mean, I've heard of artists doing this um, time and time again. But it's, it's great to see it uh, printed and presented in this type of story and as, a, as an aside one of the things I love about Faithless is on the back covers of all the books they have these quotes um, from famous painters in real life and this one has a Frida Kahlo quote um, I never paint dreams or nightmares I paint my own reality um, so essentially you get the thematics of the entire story um, surmised in one sentence by Frida fucking Kahlo one of the greatest painters of the 20th century um, so if you haven't read this, go check it out. Uh, I absolutely adore this book. Um, Maria Lovett, you know, I can't sing her praises enough. Um, she, she, you know, she, we, we talked about what the work that, uh, that Eduardo Riso does and, and in all of his books with the way he presents emotion and humanity. Um, Maria Lovett does that same thing, but in a different way. Uh, you know, her, I really don't know how to describe her art um, because it's not it's 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 nothing akin to Eduardo Riso. It's it may be there, there's maybe some Paul Pope to it, but but again, it's like I mentioned earlier, same family tree, but not on the same branch. It's it's just stunning. It's stunning, stunning work. Um, I, I I will pick up anything with her name on it at this point. Um, Matt, did you read? I, I don't remember. I know Craig did. Did you read the first Faithless? I did. I didn't stay on it though. What? Uh, oh, you didn't stay on it? No, mm-hmm. not for you. Well, that's fair. Um, I, I, man, this again. Like, if the if this in series, if this if this series maintains this, um, it's going to be on my short list for best books of the year. Uh, I, I adore this book. Nice. Um, sad, sad you didn't stick around with it, but I, I, I yeah, it, <laughs> it is not for everybody. I was telling, um. Oh, it wasn't, I forget who it was. I was telling a friend um, on a, might have been our Facebook group, it might have been somebody else's about the first issue. And when I mentioned, you know, the way that they were painting and the method that they were used to painting, they just kind of like got this look. Like you could tell they completely shut off at that point. There's no way in hell (laughs) they're going to go read this book. (laughs) Yeah, you know, anything that uh, Azarello is connected to, um, you know, he tends to do things that are extreme. You know, so that's uh, that's a look on the face that a lot of people get when you describe a lot of things Azarello has done. Yeah, but I like like to that to me though it it it's meant to make you uncomfortable, um, and it's meant to make you question things. Oh, Azarello is openly. I mean, he openly has admitted he likes to do things that are going to ruffle feathers. Yeah, and and that's what I want. I mean, if you know, on, on, I say that my mood shifts from minute to minute. Sometimes I want just pure run of the mill cookie cutter adventure um, superhero stories because I need to check out for the world. I'm just looking for escapism and, and there are books for that and there are shows for that. Um, Sometimes I'm in the mood for something that really does push boundaries and makes me question everything, um, which I think is that speaks to a lot of the the music that I like and the, the art that I look at um, when you talk about high end art. Um, but some, you know, a lot of times I want that in my comics as well. And, you know, I can turn to Eduardo Riso to do that and to be, to make me uncomfortable. Um, 
and to make me question things. Similarly, Eduardo Risso? No, no, no uh, sorry, Azarello. Um, hmm. Because he he well, and and Rizzo's work, you know, he he he'll he'll make you uncomfortable in a different kind of way. But that's because he's going to shoot somebody in the face um, <laughs> when he when he does it. Um, but no, Azarello's work does that, and it makes you question. You know, if you go back to a hundred bullets, it makes you question crime, it makes you question the impact of of culture on the world. You read as Joker, which was all you know, the, like that's what Joker is made like our idea of Joker in the twenty first century. Uh, and what was depicted in the Nolan movie, that's what that's based off of. Um, he really has a way of not only ruffling feathers, but making you uncomfortable in the, the quiet spaces of your own home. And that's fucking artistry to me. Definitely definitely on the top of my list for, for contemporary writers. Can rarely do wrong. <laughs> mm. uh, can do wrong. I've read stuff by him that I've... Yeah. But... Yeah. <laughs> um, when he, when yeah. He, again, so you have moments like Alan Moore where he's just taking a paycheck, but, um, you know. Oh, I don't, I, I'm, I've not read anything where I would accuse Azarello of just taking a paycheck. I certainly have not read, I've just read plenty of things that I didn't care for. Yeah. Well, what, which I wouldn't accuse of that. I wouldn't accuse Azarello of just taking a paycheck. Um, he certainly does not present himself in a way, anything that I've, because I've, I mean, I've read a lot of interviews with the guy I've listened to a, and I've listened to a lot of interviews and he seems very um, conscious of his own uh, integrity. Mm -hmm. um, so I certainly wouldn't accuse him of doing anything just for a paycheck. Well, was it, it am I mistaken? Is it Azarello who wrote Batman damned? Yes. Which was the bat penis thing. Like to me, like when I say taking a paycheck and even that, that book pushed boundaries and, and ruffled feathers. Um, but to me that like, when I read that, I'm like, Oh, like he, this is, this is Azarello taken. Like he, he got offered to write Batman and got a check for it. Um, that to me is one of the books that e even as genre pushing as that book was. And the fact that it did ruffle feathers and made news, um, that is when I, when I use the phrase quote unquote, taking a paycheck, I think of books like that, that he wrote, which didn't do anything for me for the story other than let me see Bruce Wayne's dick. Well, you're assuming that Azarello had it in his story notes show dick. Oh, that's true. That could have been Berhermo. Um, true. Um, I didn't think, you know, you know, I assume with something like that, that he at least knew it was coming. But again, like <laughs> even without that, like that is the only um, shock and all make you question things part of that of that story that i can remember uh, so <laughs> batman's dick was shock and awe and made you question things <laughs> uh, the closest thing to a can i mean oh i had a lot of questions after that. Uh, but but that, so when i say like that azarello is not the faithless azarello or the joker azarello or the hundred bu bullets azarello um it's just not so um in that tone i think he took a check on those, but he still took a check and did something cool with it. So made, made waves. So, you know, he did his job. Um, I'd rather read faithless though. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, well, all right. As always, uh, new comic books are coming out, um, mostly on Wednesday, but it looks like a little bit on Tuesday now, which is, which is cool. The industry is changing. The world is, is, is moving on. Um, which is, is, it's a fun time to be a comic book fan. Um, but as always, we like to uh, give folks a little, a little opinion. You know, something that we're we're hedging our bets, we're setting the menu, so to speak, of things that are going to come out next week that that might be worth your time to pick up. Um, Craig, or blah blah blah, Craig, Matt. <laughs> we usually start with Craig. See, <laughs> I miss my friend. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what are what are you going to grab this next week, bud? Well, I'm hoping to pick up if I can get my hands on uh, this book titled. That Texas Blood. This is number one. This is an Image Comics book. This is written by Chris Condon and illustrated by Jacob Phillips. So this is Jacob Phillips' first um, solo artist, creator-owned series. This is a what's called a mature neo-western crime series that kicks off when the search for a casserole dish leads to a dark, intense confrontation. Casserole dish. That's got to be a hell of a dish. We take our casserole dishes very seriously in the oh, South. Oh, yes, we do. Those aren't those aren't gifts. Those are loners, people. 
Oh, but that's but like the food inside them is a like that you send a message with your casserole dish. <laughs> so, Southern grandmothers have have um, distributed the utmost amount of shade <laughs> with the casserole dish that they deliver. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is the it is the food equivalent of bless your heart. <laughs> so oh man, casseroles. So I, yeah, this has really got my attention. Of course, I'm a true. I'm not not, not true. I'm a uh, crime fan i like just a good mm-hmm. ground level crime story i don't think i knew that about you oh yeah all right I, probably the first time i've ever mentioned it um <laughs> and this in of course westerns as well i like a good western and this being you know a um a uh, not a western set in the past but a current day western i really like those as well so this has got the elements at least to be a story that i'm really really going to be into uh, but uh, we'll see if it uh, delivers. Nice. I'm gonna have to check that out. Um, it's gonna be interesting to see what Phillips Jr. does off on his own. Um, I've got a lot of faith in that man. Uh, when it comes to comics, he he's got a mm-hmm. he comes from from a good pedigree of yep. of people, um, and has just been really doing stunning work. Uh, you know, and I don't know that that's. Yeah, I'm sure some of that is under the tutelage of his father, but you can also see like he's just kind of branching out and and really taking taking the reins for himself, which is nice. Um, it's going to be fun to watch his career develop. Um, so, in the tone of of those important and culturally uh, necessary things, um, there is a very serious book coming out next week. That um, I mean, you know, you guys know how my my love of realism and books that really speak. Um, true to the world. And so I would encourage you all to go pick up um, something called cat shit one, uh, which is coming out next week. (laughs) So, um, cat Mm. shit one is actually a manga that is, uh, it's written by a a guy named uh, Mofimi, Motofumi Kobayashi. Uh, and the series is called cat shit. This is coming out from a publisher, uh, that we don't give a lot of love to because 90% of the time I don't give a shit about what they're producing, but it's Antarctic press. Um, they are folks that, uh, you know, if you want edge Lord, they, they produce a lot of edge Lord bullshit. Um, but this manga, um, is, it's being, it's first time it hits the U S and it's, uh, gets a lot of love, uh, overseas. So, I mean, some people call it a seminal manga opus, and by some people, I mean the um, the preview for this. Sergeant Perky, Rats, and Botstanky, the members of the Special Forces Cat Shit One, uh, continue their bravery in this story. Um, essentially, it's a Vietnam story, uh, Vietnam manga, uh, told through animals, um, mm. and it's really funny. Uh, it, and you know, I was completely being sarcastic when I, you know, talk about speaking truth to the world. Um, it, it is a Vietnam story, but uh, it's it's very on your nose Vietnam story. Uh, so I'm very excited about about checking this out. Again, I, I love talking animal books. I love anthropomorphic stuff. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna check this out. But I mean, the last line of the of the promo says, "Don't be fooled by how these look. These rabbits firing more than pellets." That should tell you kind of all you need to know about the tone of the story. <laughs> so, Damn. Um, yeah, check it out. Called Cat Shit One. <laughs> uh, from wow. Atlantic Press. Uh, I imagine there will be much chuckling over this book once I finally get to read it. So, well, man. We much chuckling. It. Yes, yeah, much I, chuck- actually, we do have something else. So, since Craig is not here, uh, there's two things I want to mention that uh, I know he would have mentioned. One of the books coming out next week is... Dead Body Road. Nice. Yeah, I know he would want to mention this. It's Dead Body Road, Bad Blood, number one, from, of course, Justin Jordan, uh, Ben uh, Tizma, Mateo Scalera, Matt Lopez, and Marino Decinio. Probably said that wrong. Um, Image Comic Books. This, uh, I read Dead Body Road, the first series. Did you read that years ago, Caleb? Yeah, great. Really, I mean, it's, dug it's that. Justin. I'm I'm gonna read yeah. most, if not everything, Justin writes. That's a series that you know a lot of Justin Jordan fans. It, it had escaped because it's first time it came out years ago, and secondly, it was just a crime story, so it wasn't 
wasn't in line with more of his fantastical stuff. Mm -hmm. That's something he mentioned on the show when he was on is how much he likes to do write crime. And what I wanted to say is do more. Right. Because it's really, he's really good at it. So I'm really looking forward to that series. I know Craig would want that one mentioned. Secondly, um, sad news is uh, John Lehman let it be known that we are no longer going to get any more Outer Darkness stories that Skybound Entertainment has told him that it's not selling well enough to do. So they're telling him that he is done with Outer Darkness stories, oh, which. Shit. Yeah, bum me out, man. I'm loving that series. Craig has been loving it as well. So two little news bites that I wanted to uh, share in the spirit of um, Mr. Lance. Well, I know both of y'all love that. I'm, I'm, that's the story that I'm not reading. I know both of y'all love that. So I hate to hear that for y'all. Yeah, it is a real bummer. Because it uh, certainly was a good story, very original, very creative, very compelling characters. Um, somewhat surprised that the sales are so low that Skybound's canceling it on them. Um, but hey, them's the breaks. Yeah. Yeah, because Skybound, I mean, Image in general, produces some stuff that doesn't sell very well that they won't quit producing so yeah i know right i'm like i'm blaming the covid yeah that that would make the most sense yeah, um, why not but it did was it was it layman that i sent you the message about that's going to be writing something else uh, in the future that's in your wheelhouse that doesn't ring a bell um is it not john layman who's going to be doing the new um mars attacks book Oh yeah. Yeah. The Mars attacks crossover with what is it? I don't have it in front of me right now. So, yeah. um, mm. so not a very good, it. sorry, John Lehman, not a very good plug. <laughs> we just gave you there. <laughs> um, but I mean, you're getting more Lehman coming out. So sad day for that one, but, uh, the mighty Lehman still rolls on. He does. Uh, producing amazing stuff that I should enjoy read his work. He is. He's yeah. Like, he's a very, very dependable writer. Yeah, he's, for some reason, I just have never picked up much of his stuff, and I don't know why, because I know he's a really good writer, and I know I would love it if I read it. Just what, of, what, it, it what of his have you read that you really dug? Oh, um, I would have to go back and check. It, it's, it's, there, hasn't been a, there hasn't been a lot of his that I've actually read, and that's the problem. Um, okay, so I can't help but notice you didn't say Chew. I read the first volume of Chew, and I really liked that. I haven't I haven't gone on and to read anything. I I can't say that I love Chew because I haven't read the entirety of Chew. And again, that's my fault. I should have. Um, I don't know. I I just haven't, and I need to to remedy that because uh, Craig loves it. You love it. Um, I, I I haven't. Is is he doing Farmhand? No, that's Guillory. Guillory was the artist on Chew. On Chew, gotcha. Yeah, I knew yeah. there was some connection there. Um, but yeah. no, so it's I, I love I love the first arc. I just haven't dove into more, and I need to remedy that. And I should. Yeah. Yeah. I it should. was really, really good. Yeah. Layman, Layman does a lot of, um, you know, short stories. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, and he'll, he'll turn something that seems just like an awful idea into something very, very entertaining. Um, <laughs> and I, I, you know, brought that to the forefront when I talked about his judge dread versus punisher versus aliens book. I don't see how that could be anything but a good idea, personally. It was, I mean, it was, yeah. And he, he turned that into a very good book. Just a hell of a <laughs> lot of fun. Silly. He really captured the 2000 AD absurdity. In his, he, could, he captured that in a great way. The absurdity of the 2000 AD universe in that little, I think it was only three issues. Yeah. I just, I, 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 so I will make, that, that's going to be my um, promise to you before the end of the year. I will read Chew in its entirety. You'll thank yourself and you'll thank me because it's say, a, that, no, Matt, I'll thank you. And I'll Ch thank Chew, you. yeah, yeah. Chew's great story. Great story. I mean, everything about it. Rob Guillory, um, you know, his art, you know, as Craig and I have bragged on as well, but it's not only just his art, it's what he adds to the background. His favorite mm -hmm. thing to do, one of his favorite things to do, I should say, is to add little things in the background, like little logos or a fake poster, something that completely 
you know, that he brings to the story, not only visually, but the humor in that book is through the roof. It's a great storytelling, great right. storytelling, but it's also legitimately very funny. And again, as Craig and I have mentioned, he complete, Guillory completely changes the tone of the book because if you, if you read Chu without, if it was a prose book, it'd be a horror story. Right. It'd be a, it'd be a crime horror story because it's about a cannibal cop. Um, but with Guillory's art, the way he delivers the art, it turns it into a, um, you know, like a dark, it, well, it's a dark comedy. Yeah. It's right. a dark comedy, but it doesn't, but it, the, but it's dark with a small D because of the way Guillory illustrates it. It's very vibrant colors, very over the top cartoony expressionism. It's just so good. So it's very unique mixture done very, very well. I, I say it all the time. That's the dualistic nature of comics that only comics can bring you. Um, you know, they can, you know, you read one thing and you see something else and it combines an incredible, incredible way to tell stories. So, well, all right. Are, are we ready now? I think we have to be. All right. I think we're done. Um, I enjoyed this. Did you enjoy this? Yeah, this was fun. Of I course. had a great time. We didn't, we don't, so we don't even need Craig. Oh, <laughs> I'm joking. Gonna need to, gonna, gonna, uh, need, gonna need to hit the sneeze button there where you, you know, the little edit button. Nah, I, he, he'll laugh when he hears that because he knows it's <laughs> bullshit. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we're not going to bite the hand that feeds us. No, um, we, we did miss our brother, but we hope he, he and you all uh, out there who are fathers had an amazing Father's Day. Um, Kick back, take your shoes off, relax for a little bit um, if you can. Enjoy it. You earned it by, you know, most of your kids didn't grow up to be murderers, and so that's a win, um, you know, most of. But uh, so have a great Father's Day out there. If you want more of this, if you want to talk to us um, about any of the books that we spoke about on today's show or maybe some ones that you want to speak about or you want us to speak about, um, come find us. We're on, well, I say we, Matt's not because uh, he's smarter than I am. <laughs> he has avoided Facebook. Um, Just more resilient. That's all. Not we, smarter. We are on the Facebooks and we are on the Twitter and we're on the Instagram. Um, and we're nowhere else. We should, we should probably branch out and, and jump on like TikTok or something. I want to see the funny videos that Matt can make. Uh, cause that would be <laughs> hilarious to me. Um, but we haven't done that yet cause we're not brave. We're not brave men. <laughs> that's that's a that's a section of the world we're not ready for um but we we enjoy it we want to connect with you guys we hope you enjoy our show we enjoy doing it um fire us an email if you have any questions comments or concerns or maybe you're working on a project you you want us to to shine a light on for you for our audience you can do that at southern fried geekery at gmail.com um we're gonna be back here n next week um might not be the same time same place but we'll definitely be the same channel um, we've got something kind of fun for next week uh, that I'm not sure I should get it put out on next Sunday. Um, but I think you guys will enjoy it. I know we will as well. Um, but if nothing else, um, have a great week, go forth and love some comics. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> if not, if, if nothing else, that'll make Craig feel missed. Do I, do I get to, do I get to comment on that? Woo. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> that was, that was a special woo. <laughs> that was woo by numbers really bad numbers that yes that is the right way of putting that i loved it <laughs> i loved it uh. <laughs>